Hi there, Matt. How are you? Hi, David. Yes, very well, thanks. Good to be here. Good to see you. Um, so, yeah, so uh, it's, it's, we're recording this on Friday at about 4.30. So uh, both myself and Matt are very excited. It's Friday. It's nearly the weekend, nearly the end of lockdown. <laughs> Happy yeah. days. So we're nearly there. So, um, so just a quick, quick, quick intro to everything, as, as you know, I always like to do. So um, I'm the CEO of GCS Recruitment. It's my 20th year this week in, with GCS recruitment. So there we go. Congratulations, <laughs> uh, that's a good then, innings, that is. Yeah, I know, that's right. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about my my first placement in a while with regards to the company we worked for, but I think we'll talk about that already. Um, GCS is a global technology recruitment firm um, who specialise in linking, connecting expert talent to innovative companies, um, of which the, the company that Matt represents, Elsevier, uh, is one of those very innovative companies. Um, GCS Connect and the Leader Series is our way of bringing that community together with online events, webinars, uh, and this podcast in order to kind of share conversations, ideas, um, and different um, and, and different subjects, which hopefully allow people to kind of really you know buy into and kind of communicate with people within these communities. And we've been doing it now for uh, a couple of years, and it's been really really good to see some of the outcomes that have come out of this. Um, Matt is the uh, Director for Quality Engineering at Olsevia, um, based in Oxford, um, and uh, I believe they have a history of 500 years, you're telling me, back to, back to the original Dutch or something like that. We won't go too much into the history, but... Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I couldn't really... quote the exact date, but the, the history is, it goes back when, some way. Yeah. When Gutenberg was putting the printing press together and he was stood by his side thinking, how can I make money out of this or something like that. Uh, Matt is um, someone who's got a number of years experience in, in, in this area. We're going to go through into more detail. I'm really excited to have him on board because obviously we know that QA, testing and quality is such a key part of every single software process. And it's really interesting for me personally to kind of find out how that has been affected by the kind of current COVID situation. Um, Matt, obviously that's my introduction to you. Do you want to take us through a little bit about your role, what you do, you know, your, your particular kind of interests within technology? Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, so in terms of my background, um, it's my first proper job, you could say, back, I think, 2001, natural Adabas programmer um, for a well-known oh, okay. car company. Yeah, well-known car company Adabas. in the northeast of England, where I'm from. Um, so started out in the, in the software development space. Yeah. Um, but since 2006, when I first moved into um, software testing, I yep. would say, you know, I'm a... I'm a software engineering quality guy, I guess, is, is the best way of putting it. Right. Um, so all my roles in the last 14 years or so have been within in the software development space, but always with that quality angle. So yeah. whether that's been for consultancies or, or program management or whatever mm. that's been, it's, it's always been from a, a testing and quality assurance perspective. What, what attracted you to that side? I mean, it's a little bit like a kind of recruiter. I don't think people always want to get into computers, but don't necessarily want to be testers. So, you know, I always go, no one's ever grown up wanting to be a recruitment consultant, right? So, has anyone ever grown up wanting to be a tester? So, but, but when you do it, I guess you love it. So, what, what particularly attracted you to that side as opposed to maybe more the development side? Yeah, that, that's right. It's it's not the sort of thing, as you say, grow up, you want to be a, a software tester or a quality assurance guy. Um, yeah. Categorically, no one has ever done that. Um, I'll be a recruiter. I don't think anyone's ever yeah, done that either. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> personally, myself, and I, I think this probably goes for a number of people. I, I kind of almost fell into the role a little bit, and I knew I enjoyed working in the software development space and, and wanted to learn more there. But then you then you look around and think, well, what exactly do I want to do? And I had a good opportunity came up uh, for working for a consultancy. So um, I wouldn't say it was a planned move into into this area of software development yeah. but once you get there it's it's definitely a mindset you know mm. for, a, for a QA person um, it's yeah. above anything else the technical skills whatever it might be it's the mindset yeah. you get these people that are naturally curious they naturally want to, to break things they want to understand how something works the sort of person when you're a child you might have taken something apart and then failed to put it back together again it's it's that mindset yeah. of how does it work underneath and that's what I always look for, you know, recruiting uh, QA people is do they have that, that curiosity? Uh, yeah, okay. And I think that's what attracts yeah. most people to, to the role. Yeah, because it, it, I mean, it is the, 
you know, when, whenever we're like training recruiters and how, you know, how to understand technology, you know, things can't go out with bugs, can they? You know, we always talk about a computer game, you play a computer game and if there's a bug in it, unless they put the bug in to give you a special way through the levels or something like that, you would be amazed, wouldn't you? Like you can't release stuff that doesn't work. Yeah. Um, and so therefore you have to test everything probably as much as you develop it, don't you? It's, just, it's an integral part of the whole uh, life cycle. That, that's right. And part of my roles that I do is, is promoting that, that viewpoint and that mindset. Because yeah. funnily enough, I don't think that, that kind of mindset's always always been there in the industry. You know, it was very much a especially when I started out, it could be an, an afterthought. Whereas these days it's very much becoming more integral to the development process itself. And um that's one of the roles I like to think I perform is to promote that mindset. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And do you think that's that's also links into what the developers are doing? You know, do you have to promote that mindset in I mean I know yeah. with agile and testing as developers and that sort of thing, it is much more integral now, but you know, yeah, you exactly. Kind of look, look, that, back, look, think about what you're doing. Type thing. Yeah, that, that's something I'm, I hope we can talk about in a bit more detail as, as, as you know, the chat goes on. But um, absolutely, um, if you're just focusing your your quality in one role, you're going to have to hire an awful lot of people. <laughs> yeah, it makes right, yeah. it makes sense for the company to to infuse that quality mindset throughout the org, and that's everybody involved, not not just developers. It can be. The, the owners of the product, the architects, the developers, yeah. whoever's involved really, that promoting that quality mindset gives you a lot of return on on, on that investment. Who's the company that, that you look to that you think they do it really well? Mm. Oh goodness, that's, that's a hard question. I mean, the obvious tech companies spring to mind, you know, the, the, the Googles and the Facebook of this world, yeah. merely from the fact that they've, they've managed to um, Come, move towards a very fast turnaround, continuous delivery approach. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, the problem with doing that is obviously you go faster, you, you can make mistakes. So the, yeah. the, art, the art form, I guess, is, is, to, is to, to move fast, but also do it in a quality manner. Um, yeah, those those yeah. big tech companies seem to have cracked that, um, mm. where it appears mo most other industries are on a journey to become a bit more like that. Yeah, yeah, and I link. I think it, it links a lot into kind of DevOps and that sort of thing. And that, like you said, that continuous development, which I'm sure we'll talk about more. So, so you as a leader, um, you obviously came from the shop floor, as it were, where you're kind of doing the job and moved into kind of management and leadership, which not all not all technical people do. Um, at what point did you do that within your career? Um, reasonably early on, actually, I, I think okay. I, I took on my te first test manager role, I think two years into my software testing okay. career, which was really scary at the time because it kind of felt like yeah. um, felt like a bit of an imposter, you know, taking on mm. this role that I'd never done before, where everybody else you talk to, the developers, whoever, they, they know more about it than you do. So uh, yeah. <laughs> it was quite quite an early move, but I was mm. I was lucky in my career. I had a I had a few people around me that weren't scared to you know to put people they thought could do it into those positions and give them give yeah. them the support they needed so um having a good boss is always important and having someone that looks out for talent and and looks to put that talent into positions where they can you know they can progress yeah that's right it's because really i think it, uh, leadership is definitely something that is kind of within you isn't it you know you you can and from an early age you know i know with people we have within gcs there's certain people that that can take on responsibility. It doesn't really matter what age they are, does it? Yeah, leadership's not, it shouldn't be a position. It shouldn't be a, a job title to an mm. extent because you get leaders at all uh, levels of the organization. Yeah. Uh, and, and often you, you get the, you know, the, the, the fresh blood that comes in with new ideas. Yeah. Uh, who, who, who show lead, right. Yeah, they can show leadership more than anybody else. So yeah. Yeah, it's, it's important to identify those people early on, I think, and yeah. look to support them in, those, in their careers. And there's a leader over the last few years within your organization what are those kind of significant challenges that you've you've had to deal with you know uh, as you've progressed through your kind of companies and projects yeah so I, I was thinking about this one a little bit and considering you know i started out in software testing around 2006 mm. um, that almost feels like uh, an, another lifetime ago another generation yeah, uh, you know, you feel like the old guy reminiscing about the old days because, in terms of software development, it was a different generation. 
Mm. Um, the big challenge I've had over the course of my career, especially someone in quality, um, is reacting to the fact, you know, most companies, they operated within their own, uh, their own domains. So if you're mm. a publishing company, you're a publishing company. Uh, these days, what I'm seeing is a lot more companies are moving towards being a tech company with a specialism. Right? So yeah. you're no longer a financial services company. You're a tech, tech company that does financial services. Mm. Um, and one of the reasons for that is, you know, is the explosion of digital offerings and, and needing yeah. to be able to update your offerings on a very regular basis. Um, when I started out, there was a lot of industries where if you were deploying new features, upgrades, say once every six months, once every yeah. four months, you may have been market leading in your in your industry. Mm. Um, these days, most industries, if you're deploying every six months, you, you're one of the lower performers. Yeah. So that challenge comes with this. Everybody's moving to being a tech company. Everybody's mm. speeding up. Everyone needs to deliver continuously. Um, from a quality perspective, if you kept working with the old ways of working, that, that is a it's unsustainable. It's a nightmare. So for me personally, a big challenge has been reacting um, to that, that that change in the market where everyone's moving towards uh, continually delivering. And yeah, that's right. And, that, and I guess that links into the kind of the automation tools that you use. It links into, like you said, having quality yeah. go through the organisation. Yeah. But I guess you know you and your and your role have to take some quite big calls, right? You know, and I. As they say, that do you ever have you ever learned from mistakes? So you have said, okay, that's fine, and then it's kind of bit you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> every, 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 day, every day, perhaps yeah. is, is the real answer to that. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, in my type of role, you, you have to use technology to address those challenges. Mm. Um, if you're continuously delivering, you you can't come up with a strategy that says we're going to manually test every new feature. Yeah. Um, so you, you need to embrace and adopt technologies to do that. So mm. the move of software testing into DevOps, um, the more recent, I guess you could say it as a rebadging, re I suppose, some ways. You, most software testing roles these days are quality engineering roles. Yeah. Um, but for me, that's not just a change of a name. It's actually a change of focus as well. Um, software testing is always still part of it. Uh, but for me, quality engineering is is really building in um, the the quality and the testing aspects into those CI pipelines and into DevOps. So, I mean, that's that's the for me that's the direction of the market. And as for making mistakes, oh yeah, all the time with that. Um, yeah. Um, hiring hiring is a good example. Um, <laughs> big mis big mistake early. Well, as I say, early in my career, actually. The big mistake I've repeated a few times in my career, unfortunately, is um, hiring for perfection. Right, so, yeah, okay. So talking about DevOps, so if I'm hiring mm. a, a quality engineering guy, it's very easy to say, you must know all of the CI tools, you must know uh, all of the tools that manage your version control, your code. You must know all the performance testing tools. Um, and eventually, with these good intentions in mind, thinking about, building quality into, into DevOps and CI, you come up with such a laundry list of, of requirements that you're never going to find this unicorn person that can meet them all. Yeah. Them all. Um, so I've had yeah, to- Yeah, we, we get out of recruitment sometimes, you know, sometimes like what the recruiter has to push back on. You, mm. you know, you, you've got, this is the budget you've got. This is what you're asking me for. Yeah. And it's sometimes really hard for recruiters desperate to, to make the placement and make the customer happy. But sometimes you have to say that, you're not going to find this person. This is yeah. this is a unicorn, you know. <laughs> you know, you, this is what you will find for the money you're paying. And even if you paid all the money and the sun, you still wouldn't find this person because it's not yeah. not possible to combine all these all these things. Or there's one person in the world that can do it, and yeah. they're yeah. they're they're already working for you. So <laughs> and that's usually yeah. what we find is yeah, you've got three of them. They're already working for you. So you have yeah. to how did, how did they start? And then you kind of refashion the qualifications. And I think. You know, hiring the right team around you as a leader is a, a great way of overcoming those challenges and stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, for you, you've obviously talked about the progression of how quality and testing and and, and software has progressed. How, how, what tech tools have you particularly used yourself that have sort of helped you to to grow with that? I mean, you talked about people, but you know, how have you how have you 
changed your armory and your toolkit as it were yeah so i mean look back 10 years what what defined say um the tester that was technically minded or on, on new tooling yeah. that was probably someone that could do some database queries perhaps or they could do some um you know recording style automation where you you press record and you, you go through a, a user journey and then mm -hmm. you simply repeat back that recording that that was probably what defined a you know a set of tools or a technical person in in quality assurance 10 years ago yeah um today i guess what we look for in terms of tooling um quality engineers that have a, a good understanding of, of ci pipelines yeah um, so that, that continuously automating everything is is a theory that some people buy into. Yeah. I'm not quite on the side of automating everything. I, I feel there's always space for, for humans and the human elements. Yeah, yeah. But automating away as much of the repetitive, um, boring stuff as possible, I think, is a good yeah. strategy. So in terms of tooling, um, what do I look for for my QA engineers? It, it is, do, do you know the, the common pipeline tools the likes of say Jenkins and yeah. um, can you can you select and use the automation tooling that the test tooling that we're going to build in yeah whether yeah. that's um whether that's automating the UI front end automating at the API levels mm -hmm. or even at the lower layers um, that that strong focus on the tooling is, is important yeah. yeah and and do you do you think that you know from your side you know I guess without the automation test tooling and setting up in the right way There'd be no way that you could have this continuous development where you're releasing new products on a weekly yeah. or monthly basis. It would just wouldn't exactly. Be possible. Without that tooling in place, it wouldn't be possible to to maintain high standards of quality whilst also releasing on a continual basis. Yeah, and one one interesting thing you just said there is that you, you feel obviously that automation can't do everything. Mm. You know, and you're obviously a leader, and you've talked about hiring people. And one of the key things. Um, the key things that, that that we're talking about here is um, as leaders, you know, and, and leaders, you generally think about leading people, right, rather than robots. <laughs> yeah, otherwise, you probably automate your leader. Um, can you see a point where you would be running a, a series of automated test tools? Or do you still do you still see that the, the human element within, well, every job, but particularly kind of quality is, is important? Yeah, so to some extent, I think it depends on on, on what what you're building. Mm. Um, some things can be done repetitively um, yeah. without too much human intervention. Um, but take the example: you're building a, a brand new product, or you're you're implementing a, a large change to the behaviour mm. of a product. The, the the automation can tell you um, what's been broken since the last time you ran it. It can yeah. it can check what you've previously tested. But it's not yet, I don't think, at the point where it can replicate that human curiosity. You know, of, yeah. oh, what happens if I try this? Or um, that, that's blue, should it really be red? Um, there's still yeah. that, human, that human element. You know, talk about the curiosity that I look for in, in, mm -hmm. in quality engineers earlier. I, I yeah, think that's, that's still, right. a, it's still a big part of what we do today. So um, tool, tooling is advancing. You know, machine learning in particular is starting to make way, waves in software testing it's starting to come to the point where it can be useful mm. so maybe that'll change my mind two years from now but uh, you know as we sit here today i still think there's a there's in most situations there's definite room for the, the human element yeah I, 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 it's, it's very interesting isn't it and it links us into the kind of leadership side of your role and the, the role of everyone that we speak to on the leader series the question I always ask is we were working from home at the moment, and that's not even fun anymore, is it? It's not even like a new thing, oh, we're working from home. Just, yeah, the novelty's worn off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think we're both, we've both discussed we're both in tier two, so we, hmm. can, we can go to a pub at some point and yeah. see our friends, but not really, so I think we're kind of we're under the cover of the night, right? So I think we've all understood that this is the new way of working. How has it changed your way of being a leader? And in fact, actually, this is quite interesting because you started your new role in July. So you're telling me you've only really actually met your team once and met your boss once. So how, how, how is that? I mean, what is that? Like? Yeah, that's right. So I, I changed roles yeah. beginning of September. Um, yeah. So I went through the whole recruitment process uh, virtually. 
Yeah. Um, I have to say, I, I would normally consider myself to be uh, someone who who does well in a in a interview situation. I normally like to think I, I come across you know well. Uh, yeah. My success rate of interviews is is, is pretty good, but yeah. doing it virtually, honestly, it, it was there was a difference for me. I, I found a bit more of a struggle than I would normally do. You know, going to an office mm. and interviewing. And I think it was simply because just not used to that way of working, you know, yeah. missing out on slightly on the human elements. Like you go in for an interview in, in an office and you might get the opportunity while you're walking to the, the meeting room to have a chat about, you know, the weather or football or whatever it might be. Mm. Uh, you, you don't so much get that over, over Zoom or, or one of the other tools you can use. So I found it strange. It was a, a weird experience for me. And I've yeah, been to the office done. once, once in three months. So, yeah. 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 I was I was telling people that uh, my third ever placement, um, my start of my career was at that building. It's a huge building, and I placed the Vax VMS operator. I was telling you, wasn't I? So back in the day, so it's uh, exciting. It's a lovely building, isn't it? And it's, it's, you know, you go into the, the offices now, and you think, God, this is just such a waste of a space, isn't it? You know, our, our GCS office, the headquarters in Reading, we could have seventy people in there, and I've been in there. They've got like four or five. You know, and looking around at this, this beautiful space that you've created, and it's wasted, isn't it? You know, so, so yeah. So, how can you? How has that changed you? As you've been a leader in you know an environment, probably where there has been some remote working, but mostly on site. Um, how, how has it changed the way you've worked with your people? Yeah, I mean, I think well, there, there are some there are some upsides, and I think one of mm. those is is that it does force leaders to to work in a different way. Mm. Um, I think I have to put a, a lot more effort in, actually. Um, so, say the example you have a new starter coming on board. Well, you, you have to make more of an effort with that person. You need to spend more time with your people to make up for the fact you, you're not seeing them around the office every day. Mm. So, for me, I, I, I've switched to a way of being much more focused on my people, um, almost being a, a, a little kinder, I would say. So my own experience coming on board, you know, with Elsevier, mm. it's it's tough because you can't walk around the office, you can't you can't bump into people at the coffee machine. You're you're reliant yeah. on the on the kindness of strangers to some extent, you know. Uh, putting in yeah. Zoom requests, you know, a half an hour formal meeting just to have an informal chat in people's busy day. You're asking yeah, yeah. you're asking quite a lot in that situation. Um, so I think it's incumbent on the on on people that are already established in their positions in in their companies, you know be that extra bit kinder, re reach out to the new starter, you know, off offer to offer to have a half hour chat with them. Uh, and do you, do you, obviously, the senior employer, are, are there in particular people of kind of HR kind of driven that? Or have you, do you feel that the inductions work well? Obviously, you talk very highly of the new role. Um, yeah. Um, I, no, I'd say it's it's more of a culture thing. Um, if, yeah. you, if you're just relying on HR to, to do the heavy lifting, you, it's probably not going to work out too well. I think it's more of a culture thing. You, yeah. you need to you need to have that that same behaviours across the board. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and you, you you mentioned about the interview and being strange. Is that was it was it partly because it's difficult? If, you know, it's quite intense, isn't it? Like a, a video call, you can't really exactly can't see what's going to really going on, and you know. You, it's, it's much more open in some ways, isn't it, face-to-face? You know, -face. Yeah, that, that's right. It, it, it's a little more intense. Look, mm. maybe six months from now, you know, if, if we're still all doing things over over video calls, maybe we'll get used to it a bit more. Yeah, um, but it, does feel, it does feel a bit more intense to, to be doing everything over. over well, they'll bring in the virtual video. reality and then we'll be in virtual reality kind of conversations. Yeah. And, that sort of thing. and um, you know, within your business, um, you know, the business that you're working within, has it changed them? Has it changed their business focus? Has it changed the way that they're getting their leaders to work? Have you, have you, have you been able to see that? Yeah, I, th I think it has. I think it's it's pushed a lot more focus on on certain elements. Mm. Um, you know, a lot of companies are, are, are trialing ways of of working a bit smarter like that. You know, maybe a, a no meeting Friday, or mm. um, you know, maybe groups to bring people together, not just talking yeah, about yeah. work all the time. Because mm. uh, you need to have that focus on on mental well being a lot more. Sure. Yeah. Um, for me, it's always the worry. You know, it's it's that one person that comes on the video call and is always on mute, never switches on the camera. You know, 
there are people that need that extra little bit of support that aren't working, yeah. aren't reacting quite as well to the situation mm. we're in now. And as leaders, you need to work a little bit harder. You need to know what's going on with your people uh, to be there to support them in those situations. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a good point. And and now you're recruiting yourself. You know, what what other um, what other advice would you give to to other kind of leaders who are in that position where they're out there recruiting? What what do you think is important for managers and leaders to do mm -hmm. um so important in recruiting you know keep the communication going constantly um, yeah. one of the things that really attracted me with elsevier was that constant communication during the whole recruitment process you know i was mm. never left wondering what's going on or how well did i do uh, yeah. regu i got regular feedback and and then you know if there was a slight delay in between a, a stage I knew about it and I knew the reason why. So it, it kind of, you know, it calms down the nerves of the candidate a little bit. Um, yeah. So, yeah, that, that focus on the, the good regular communication and regular feedback throughout the recruitment process is, yeah. is something that's uh, is something that I think about quite a lot. Yeah, because there's less of that kind of high touch, like interview, you know, you can and then you can actually move the process along much quicker because we, we found. You see, there's no logistics, is there? It's not like I've just I've just driven from Sunderland, which is where you're from. Like oh, I know you don't live anymore. I've just driven from Sunderland to Oxford, so I can't. I'm not going to drive there on Thursday as well. Whereas if you didn't go in a meeting, you go, oh, cool, yeah, we could do all the meetings in one week. You know, move the move like you talked about, like the automation process, get moving the recruitment process through a lot, a lot quicker. So the meetings can all happen in a in in the same way. So, so that I mean, that's in some ways a positive, and. That was how how the world of work can work, and obviously the world of software. What what positives do you think you see coming out of the future technology landscape, and particularly with a with a focus on quality? Um, are we talking about the you know with the current situation we're in at the moment, so ways of working, or general yeah, direction think, of the technology? Do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, it's very much around what we're trying to do here is. Is just talk about you know that like you said and like we just said you can move the recruitment process forward more quickly mm -hmm. um there's, there's elements of, of positivity that's come out of this this new situation mm -hmm. so obviously there's difficulties but for you working with your team what positives do you see coming out of how you can deliver more quality software faster more consistently more continuously do you think you can use this this way we're working to, to improve the service you're giving. Yeah, I think there could be some 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 lasting changes that come out of you know what's gone on this year. Um, mm. You know, we've talked a bit about changes to the recruitment process, looking after your people a bit more, having a focus on your people a bit more. Um, there's certainly more, much more focus on work-life balance for people as well, which yeah. has got to result in improvement in in productivity so yeah, I, sure. I, I see some good improvements in i think there'll be a, ch a difference between companies i think the companies that really invest in the situation we're in now you know turn it to, to an advantage invest in work-life balance we'll see those productivity gains it'll be interesting to yeah. see the difference between the the high performing companies and the low performing companies in that respect um, yeah exactly but it's it's those yeah. those those productivity gains we could have, you know, not having to commute to offices all the time, um, being able to work a bit more flexibly. I, I wonder if that will result in in productivity gains ultimately. Yeah. Well, I was quite interested actually because you were just talking there before about like you know releasing software and software releases. So so is is there like an internal kind of is there a competitive like you would watch other companies and how fast they're releasing stuff and. You know, do testers look at that sort of thing and think, "Oh God, how can they, how can they do this this quickly and we're so well?" You know, is that a thing? Yeah, maybe to an extent. <laughs> yes, every company is on on their own journey. You know, some yeah. some companies are still battling with trying to get their releases down from a quarterly perspective to maybe a monthly. Um, others are releasing every sprint. Others are releasing multiple times a day, um, depending on the industry and, and how much they've invested in their tooling. So. Yeah. yeah, I guess the, the, there is a bit of uh, competition going on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like that. It drives you forward sometimes. And for you going forward, how, how do you feel 
you know, we talked about about automation, but how can other innovative technology help you de deliver a better product as a, as a leader and as a, as a as a quality manager? Yeah. So from a from a QA QE perspective, um, you know, the direction of travel with technology the last few years, as we talked about, is is investing in, in more in automation. Yeah. I think that will continue. I can't see the direction of travel there changing. That will certainly continue. Um, and then we've got the more, I guess, the more bleeding edge technologies around the edges, which have made more headway in other uh, disciplines and industries, but maybe not so much in, in quality engineering testing right now. Yeah. Uh, so take, for example, machine learning. Yeah, okay. Um, that's, that's starting to bleed into the software testing industry. We're yeah. starting to see products that help with automation taking some of the, because you think about automation, you think, right, it's it's automated, so it's all fast. But actually, under, under the covers, there's a lot of manual effort that goes on there. You know? Yeah. Uh, creating the scripts, creating the elements in the scripts, mm -hmm. updating them when they change. Yeah. Um, so there's, there's an awful lot of manual work that goes on under the covers. Um, I can see room for, especially machine learning, automating away the underneath part of, of automation um, and helping, you know, helping especially with maintenance. Mm. So that maintaining your, your test scripts, maintaining your, your quality checks, uh, that could come a lot faster and a lot more smoother. However, I'm yet to see a lot, a lot of benefits there. I would still call it a bleeding edge technology when it comes to software testing. Yeah, because it, like, like you said, it links into quality, doesn't it? So you need to understand, yes, okay, you've done this, you've automated it, but have you done it well? You know, that's the whole, it's kind of says it on the tin, doesn't it, really? You need to make sure that things are done right. And, and it goes back to, like you said, about that whole cur curiosity element. You probably bring all this in, and then you want to break that and see if that doesn't work or, or not. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Testing the tests. Yeah, mutation testing is a, a phrase that's becoming more uh, popular these days. And it's, yeah, testing the test is always a good thing. Wonderful. Well, so, I, I, yeah, I'll, I'll use that. When we when we post this on social media, I'll do hashtag mutation testing, see if that kind of picks up anything. And last thing they said, obviously, we're coming from a recruitment and a talent point of view. We've talked quite a lot about this in terms of how you build the leaders. Um, how do you think that the the recruitment landscape is going to change in 2021 you know you obviously a product and someone who's been involved in the process of actually finding a job in a virtual world so you know it can work um yeah. what what do you think that the key changes will 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 continue and, and stay yeah i'll be interested to see how um the recent changes will affect sort of flexibility of working yeah um, in that, my, my guess is the, the recruitment uh, catchment areas are, are going to grow, right? Because yeah, 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 we see that. If you're not tied to a particular location, then as a as a hiring manager, I'm, I'm suddenly thinking, well, can I can I can I reach out to talent that you know, isn't maybe in a certain location? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I think it's starting to break down the perception that especially a perception that's come with Agile, you, you need to have people co-located, you need to have everybody in the same room. Yeah. Uh, and although you still get the benefits of that, actually we are seeing that you can work successfully in a remote fashion. Yeah. So I wonder as a hiring manager, as time goes on, will, I, will that open up a whole range of, of, of new talent to me that maybe are in a different region, a different country, um, and not located well, we in the city of in your office? Yeah. We've done a few Connect series, discussions on that with talent people and we've got quite a few companies that are working with that and I, I definitely think that it's um it's a whole it's a whole new world and when we're speaking to candidates ourselves you know open out your search facilities it doesn't have to be five minutes down the road you know the, maybe the, the best job for you could be could be 100 miles down the road but this is this is a really good match for you um and I think you know for me um having that that kind of opportunity can only help the candidates and help the clients. One of the interesting things, and I don't know if you guys have discussed internally, is having people work on a more global basis, how that links into, you know, cult, like you, you mentioned culture, et cetera, et cetera. You know, how, how you're gonna get that culture and that, 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 um, that, that nurturing element when everyone has all to be, like is all everywhere around the world and, and that yeah. sort of thing. Have you, have you, have you, in your past, seen any good ways of working in those global teams that's worked quite well? 
-hmm. Yeah, so um, getting that, that good communication going when you're not always in the same room, you've got to replicate that in, in different ways. Um, so, you know, the regular daily conversation stand-ups, uh, the use of video conferencing with, with videos on, Mm. Uh, if you put those things in place, you, you, I believe you can replicate um, the in-person feeling to to an extent. Yeah. So in terms of best practice, yeah, definitely keep up the communications constantly um, through a variety of methods. So yeah. yeah, use your video chat, but also you know have your instant messaging chats on the go. Make sure that you you have uh, forums or, or chat rooms set up for particular topics that you need to discuss. Mm. Um, and when it comes to meetings, again, as leaders, you have to work that little bit harder. So um, the, the old days of throwing in meetings for everything it needs needs to change. You, yeah. you need to you need to be a lot more focused. So meetings should have an agenda. They should have a you know a set time. Yeah. Ideally, finish them five minutes early just to give people a, a little break to to go and get a cup of tea or something. That's right. But, but as leaders, work that little bit harder to make sure you. you you get that culture embedded with the teams. I think that, that that comes back to the whole idea of this leader series is you're a very good example of that, Matt, is that as leaders, we need we need to, to build that, that great team and we need to build that great um, culture and it's on us to do it, isn't it? You know, that's, that's yeah. you know, like, think about the meetings, think about how people are performing, think about how you bring people into the business. It's not down to... The people within our team to do it that's that's our job and i think a good leader does that really well and obviously yeah. and that's the, that's hopefully the, the secret of your success and why you've risen so quickly through your career matt so yeah so it's been great to speak to you today um really good to understand you know the the way that the, the software and quality is is developing and um and i do hope you have a nice weekend because it's now the end of the week isn't it now matt so we can go off and it is. have it's, it's oh, after so. 5 p.m on a friday so yeah it's uh, <laughs> it's a good feeling but yeah, thanks for having me, David. It's been been great to chat. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Matt.